Oh, it's automatically goes to. Okay. Okay. Good. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I want to thank Marina Sapir for putting this together and uh, welcoming our guest lecturer this evening, Katerina Romanenko. Did I get it correct? Ah, wonderful. Got First it. try. Uh, Katerina is an educator and visual culture historian and holds a PhD in art history from the Graduate Center, CUNY, and currently works as the Assistant Director of the Youth and Family Programs at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. In the past, she worked as the Associate Director of Education at the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia, where she developed and presented educational programs exploring the history of Jews in America. For over a decade, Dr. Roman Romanenko led, leads tours at the Solomon R. Guggenheim, uh, Guggenheim Museum in New York and presents lectures, workshops, and guided tours on a variety of topics. Tonight's topic is Searching for a New World, Jewish Artists in the Period Between the World First World War and the Second World War. Uh, thank you very much for uh, spending time with us this evening. And we very much look forward to learning from you momentarily. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to start from sharing the screen because as a visual historian, I don't function unless I have pictures to support me. So just please confirm uh, that you have the like kind of blue slide. Okay. Okay, and it's moving, excellent. Um, so today's topic is uh, searching for the new world and we're going to focus uh, to on the period between like the early 20th century, basically. I had to limit it to arts in the USA because uh, it was very ambitious for one lecturer to cover Jewish artists between the wars overall because we have a lot of things happening in the world around that time, in, in Russia, in Europe, and the, in the US. So we're going to geographically focus on the US, but we will touch uh, on many things that's actually happening in Europe. And I just kind of have to mention um, that ironically, we picked uh, the subject uh, about the art between the World War I and World War II. And let's just hope that we will never talk about art between World War II and World War III with the things that's happening now in the world. Um, so with this being said, uh, I want to take us to the century like before, because in order to talk about art in America at any period of time, I think it's a good idea to take a glimpse in, to the past and just kind of to ask ourselves a question. So what's up with art history and Jewish artists in America specifically? And one of the things that we have to keep in mind that uh, with Jewish settlers coming to the United States in starting from 1654 and on, um, judging by this graph, you can see that population grew very slowly. So up to 19th century, we, we have very small Jewish community and artists are not the first people to come and practice as artists in America. Uh, they usually follow uh, and they usually come um, because of some additional events that prompt them to come. So we don't really have a way to talk about American uh, Jewish artists in all these early times in 17th, 18th century. There always were people who practiced visual arts. There were always were people who were expressing themselves visually. But in terms of art history, when uh, Jewish identity of an artist is known and they practice and continue this identity, it's, it's really not, we don't have that many examples. Really to talk about the first well-known Jewish American artist uh, would be the example of uh, Salman Nunz Garbalo. And he's coming from these families that came very early on. He's Sephardic Jew. Uh, he studies with Thomas Sully, the, the famous portraitist who made like, pr pr presidents and uh, different very important historical individuals in America. So, but allegedly he studied with Sully. So we don't even have documents proving that he actually studied with him. It's like kind of family memories. But he did practice art. He did have his studio. He moved around. He lived in, uh, in multiple cities. And we know um, 
provenance of his works, but very few of his works actually survived due to the fire in, in his studio later in his life. We know that he uh, made portrait of Lincoln. This is a copy based on Carvalho's portrait. Uh, we know that he contributed to kind of illustrated media. He did this cute engravings of uh, children with bunnies or flowers and chickens. It was super popular genre uh, in the 19th century. And we also know that he accompanied uh, Fremont to his uh, expedition and that's where he picked up photography. And that's where he started to be one of the early American photographers. So he's one example of professional artist of Jewish origin. Uh, another example would be uh, Moses Jacob Ezekiel, who is famously made this sculpture. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but this is a religious liberty sculpture that was commissioned, commissioned by Bnibrid uh, for the centennial. So it was standing in, uh, in the centennial exhibition. Then it was, <clears throat> excuse me, then it was placed in Fairmont Park in Philadelphia. And when the Jewish Museum of American, uh, the Museum of American Jewish History was built, the sculpture was moved and now it's standing and you see the building of the museum right uh, behind the sculpture. Now, Ezekiel was a uh, first American born Jewish artist who was uh, trained professionally in academy, but also received international acclaim. Now he is one of these artists that will, it will continue throughout American Jewish history and throughout American art history that he is American, but at some point he leaves America, goes to study abroad and he stays there. So his location is Rome. He is acclaimed artist in, internationally. And so why do we call him American artist? Why do we call him American Jewish artist? Because he makes art commissioned by Americans such as the sculpture and some other examples. Uh, so he is that connection uh, that the person of American origin works, studies and works in Europe but he has connection with the United States and his art is present in the United States. This pattern will continue all throughout our period that we're talking about. Now, that like so this is the question, right? So wait a second, we have American artists, we have American Jewish artists, but they all end up in Europe. Why is that? So one of the questions we wanna ask is, so what was the situation with art education in the United States? And we do have art academies in the United States established uh, as early as 1802. And that's Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, my uh, home institution. Um, and the academy was established in 1802 with the museum. The building that you see here is later building, was built in 1876. Uh, but the, the origin of the academy is fairly early on in the American history. National Academy of the Design, the Academy of Americas, right, was founded only in 1825. So Pennsylvania was, or Philadelphia rather, was the capital at some point, was the center, cultural center, and was also an institutional center for art education. But it was very traditional academy. And what is traditional academic uh, education? You are drilled on uh, copying, uh, on uh, making drawings for the five years students learn to make drawings. They draw from still lifes, they draw from sculptures. These are the images of uh, historic cast hall. So all most famous sculptures uh, from around the world, but mostly of course, Renaissance and classical sculpture was brought to Philadelphia as casts and they learned to draw them. Then eventually you move to live uh, model drawing. It's all drawing. They don't learn to make painting till much, much later and usually academic education ends with this high level of drawing skills and artists would learn actual painting in apprentice studios of like they go to specific artists to study with them. So um, academic tradition teaches vigorous skills, uh, working from models, working from sculptures, drawing skills, and it's very realistic art, idealistic. So they copy, uh, it's not the idea to represent realities. The idea is to capture what you see in most realistic, naturalistic way. It takes a long time after you complete your education, you usually get some kind of <clears throat> scholarship. You go to Europe, you study in Europe. Now you're copying the actual original cultures and old masters. Then you come back to America and you cannot really find employment because unlike Europe, 
um, we, like we didn't really have here that many commissions that would sustain people. And if you had a super famous church or a super famous individual who wants to commission really kind of famous artists, they would go to European artists because there were no famous American artists yet. So it was this kind of conflict. Uh, you go to study in the academy, but if you choose academy in the Amer in Americas, in the United States, your career is a little kind of like you in provin provincial, you in backwaters. If you really want to become professional artist, you have to go to Europe, at least to complete your education, at least to be there on some kind of scholarship. So all our artists compete for that kind of scholarship to go to study in Europe. Um, nevertheless, there was art education in America. It was not the most progressive. It was kind of stable uh, with some nuances. We're not here to cover the art education in America. I just wanted to mention that there were these options, but they had uh, limited, uh, they had some limitations there. Nevertheless, you had artists of Jewish origin professionally trained in academy. There was no limit on who is accepted to, uh, to the academy in terms of their religion or nationality unlike in Europe, which really, which stopped discriminating against Jews much later, actually like in mid 19th century. Russian Academy, like we're not even going to mention them, they continue <laughs> to discriminate against Jews. Um, now, the artist that we see on the screen here, Albert Rothenthal, his father was a professor at the Academy. He was teaching engraving. Uh, and then his son is a student in the academy and he becomes quite successful American artist, mostly making money by engraving. Engraving was a trade. It's something that uh, books, illustration, illustrators, newspapers would need. It was the way of mass producing images before photography really became that tool. Uh, so if you want to make a living as an artist, you want to have a profession, you want to have a trade that you can actually make money on. So you go to study in academy, but you go into something functional, something that will, uh, will help you to earn money. So Rosenthal here is a quite accomplished engraver. Uh, this is an example of uh, his portrait of Henry Furness. He made multiple portraits of different judges and like, I'm not like they are kind of, they're just portraits. So they're not very exciting in this regards. But you can see by the skill of this engraving that he is very accomplished, highly trained artist. Now, he was famous enough to be featured in Philadelphia Inquirer with a birthday photo. So he was congratulated for his birthday, um, which, you know, you have to be quite prominent individual in order to be featured in the Inquirer. It doesn't mention anything about his Jewish origin. And this is going to happen. Uh, that would be the uh, trend in American Jewish art history, we can call it this way. Uh, very rarely the origin, the, the religion of the person, or ethnicity of the person would be mentioned uh, because, again, America was able to establish the situation when you can be Jewish artist and you can be an art, you can be Jewish, sorry, and you can be an artist and you don't have to mix these two together. It's your choice. And what we'll see, we'll see examples of artists who would address Jewish theme, but who would not, also would not address Jewish theme and they would make art that has nothing Jewish in it. Uh, so, but they would identify Jewishly, they would practice Judaism in some ways, or at least they would be buried in, in Jewish cemeteries. So they never, but kind of denounced their Jewishness. So there was a high level of assimilation, but American Jewish artists were never in a position when we, they had to kind of cover their identity or denounce their identity. And we have plenty of examples of when they actually had to do that in some ways in, in order to practice art, for example. So here there was no real conflict in this regard. So Rosenthal is making some Art, it's actually very hard to find his paintings. Uh, it looks like he made limited amount. This is one of his, uh, the, the grandma kind of stitching, I guess. Um, it's on the, we don't know what date is it from, but you can see that he works in very kind of realistic style and his self-portrait, he's hyper-realistic and extremely detailed in his uh, engravings. And he's almost impressionistic in a way in the portrait of his grandmother. So stylistically, we also cannot really pigeonhole him into any particular style. He's academically trained, 
but he works in in in, in broad variety of genres and uh, stylistic choice. Now, as we come uh, later in uh, uh, later to the later part of the nineteenth century, there will be alternative way to academies. Academies are extremely restricted. It's hard to get accepted. It's hard to get good commissions. Uh, so Art Student League would be the first independent um, uh, first independent way to get uh, our artistic education in America. People or students would contribute money, like membership-based money, and that's how they would pay for classes. That's how they would be able to hire teachers that they want to uh, teach them. And class will run if you have enough students. So kind of free market model, but that enabled women to go to get uh, um, visual arts education. And it enabled uh, people to take classes at night, uh, part-time to stretch their education over years. Uh, so it offered a lot of flexibility and they were also able to find teachers that they really want to study with. So Art Student League was this alternative to the academy. Then, of course, we have the big wave of immigration, 1880s, uh, and uh, among many, many, like 20 million uh, immigrants, we have 2 million Jews, which is only 2%. Uh, but as you probably know better than I do, they clustered in big cities. They clustered in New York and Philadelphia. There was, there was a huge immigration community, immigrant community. And because of this concentration, it was, a, it was a community, it was a network of people speaking the same language, coming from similar or same places. Um, and that of course created a certain environment of a lot of shared uh, experiences from the past, but also in the present. And to respond to this huge wave of immigrants coming from Eastern Europe, very different from German immigration, for example, from 1870s, uh, settlement movement was picked up in America. They, it originated in England, but it was uh, picked up in America. And the idea was to do something for this uh, masses of people who come and need language, uh, they need jobs, they need to have training uh, in, in some uh, labor skills. Many of them needed training in basic like hygiene lessons and um, you know just kind of how to, to behave just because they were coming from very different uh, class of people, but also from very different cultural environment. So um, settlement movement offered that uh, kind of training, but it was clear that people cannot just work. They also need leisure time. They also need something to do at their either free time or just to express themselves somehow culturally. And visual art uh, offered that niche for many immigrants because of language barrier was much less restrictive when you do arts, right? Like you cannot really write about yourself, you can draw about yourself. So uh, when Education Alliance, the equivalent of settlement houses was established, they were art classes and they became extremely popular. And we have many, many accounts from people who took these classes, who did not become artists necessarily, but it was this um, creative niche uh, for people uh, to uh, get some kind of relief from everyday environment. And uh, I, this Education Alliance art classes, uh, the specific art school founded uh, under Education Alliance was, uh, uh, the director was Abel Ostrovsky, also an immigrant, uh, but he uh, was able to really galvanize uh, American artists of the time to provide these lessons for, uh, for immigrants. And if you'll drop a ball into a crowd of American artists at the time, the chances are you'll hit someone who studied in, uh, in uh, Education Alliance in the art school there. Just to go back to, because academies didn't really offer these opportunities uh, for people interested in less restrictive environment for art education, but also don't have time to work, uh, to learn during the day. They can only take evening classes. Um, so the connection is there. This is just a list of artists who did study in academy. If you're into arts, you will know many, many names. They are uh, quite prominent American artists. Now, who are these teachers, right? Who are the people who teach in art league school at that point? So we're jumping from the question about what was available in terms of artistic education in America to 
what was the dominant style of the early 20th century in America? And the dominant style, and when I say dominant, it, we have to understand that we talk about large cities on the East Coast mostly, because there were regional differences, but that's the dominant style because that's why our, where our immigrants are coming, right? Mostly this kind of New York area and the East Coast area. So this style that picked up and we can really see uh, American roots in the style is Ashken school or the kind of trend of social realism, not to confuse with socialist realism. This is social realism is uh, the way for artists to look at ev like basically to um, emphasize and highlight everyday environment versus classical subjects, nude sculpture of endless Davids and Aphrodites and you know, things that the Academy would do. Or history genre where academic painters would be commissioned to create paintings in historical genre that has not much relevance to everyday environment. Now Ashkin School uh, was a group of artists they exhibited together, but they, they started the trend. It's not limited to these eight artists. So they would paint genre scenes from restaurants, from city streets, New York and large cities became emphasis, became the point uh, of interest for this artist because it was such a fast and changing environment. And they felt that uh, the new world is born there. So they wanted to capture it. So this is just a couple of examples. And um, the, so the generation of artists who go to art school in uh, Education Alliance get their artistic training from Ashkan's uh, school uh, teachers, from teachers who are interested in everyday life. So it's a great merger, right? The immigrant artists observe the life around them and they get uh, trained and they also get encouraged to depict this life. So not surprisingly, we have a lot of genre painting that come out. Uh, around this time and we have interest in in painting what you see now if you're a Jewish American new immigrant Jewish American you're going to paint what you see you end up depicting the life of Jewish Americans not that they were seeking to depict Jewish American life it's probably just a result of them capturing what they see as they walk the streets uh, one of the most famous families that gave birth to three artists uh, is the Sawyer family. So three brothers practiced uh, art. They all went to, um, to school, different schools actually, but they all picked that idea of uh, capturing the life around them. But even by looking at these two examples, one is by Raphael Sawyer, the other one by, is by Isaac Sawyer, you see how different their style is, right? Uh, one is very earthly colors, very, um, it's a depression era painting, but it's not so much about the depression, but it's just kind of showing the core of the people in the work. The other one is also not far from depression, but it's much brighter. It's almost kind of whimsical with a little bit of collapsed space. So um, it gives you very different vibe. And then Moses Sawyer just, just kind of wanted to show, kill two birds in the same slide, uh, shows three brothers in very uh, realistic um, style with elements of uh, little impressionism there. Um, so that would be the art in America, uh, quite dominant. Many artists practice that in terms of Jewish artists, we don't have that many Jewish artists, but those who work and identify Jewishly would share the same principles as Ashkin School and a social realist school. Um, and then, uh, so to, just to give you a few examples, Leon Kroll uh, is coming out of that school, but he's also influenced by French Impressionists. He travels to Europe, he sees French Impressionists there. So he depicts New York scene, but he absorbs the French Impressionist yeah. style. Well, I mean, Impressionist was quite, uh, quite a hit in America because remember our 19th century artists are in Paris or in Rome. So they see what's going on in Europe in 19th century. So they're influenced by European styles. Uh, so here we see how he brings that idea of capturing the fleeting moment, light effects, atmospheric effects into the cities of New York. Uh, now we look at this old photo and for us it's, oh, that's New York City, like old New York City. We have to remember that for them, the skyscrapers are growing as they look. So this is the most modern thing 
uh, that they see and they want to capture uh, that um, that vibrancy of the city. Um, that's another example of painting that's even called Manhattan rhythms. It's not necessarily landscape that he's doing, but really trying to capture the modernization and construction that's going on in the city. As we look at the later career of Kroll, he is uh, going back and forth. He's painting landscape. He is addressing classic kind of quasi classical scenes where you have a landscape of seemingly modern landscape, but the people in that landscape uh, in the top right corner are very classicized. And Jerome Myers, the artist that we're going to talk about next, uh, said about Kroll that he was really fluent in many branches of art but nothing uh, moved him from carrying on the classical, kind of classical banner, classical tradition through the turmoil of modernism. So uh, we sense from this quote that Jerome Myers admires uh, Kroll's ability to stay classical, to stay um, true to his principles and to his trainings through the turmoil of modernism. That begs the question, what turmoil of modernism he's talking about? This is Jerome Myers, and he's our link to the other side of American art and American Jewish art, uh, which would be the art of avant-garde, like innovative art that was brought to America from Europe. So Myers, not surprisingly, studied in the art student link for eight years. Then he went to Paris for a few months, as everyone, practically everyone did. When he comes back, he's not impressed with what's going on in Paris around that time. And 1807, 1805, what's going on in Paris? Just to put it in the context, Cezanne has his retrospective exhibition, post uh, um, retrospective. They discover Van Gogh. Suddenly they realize, wait a minute, that's what you can do with painting. Matisse, early cubism. So this whole thing starts in Paris. You can see that if you want to. It looks like Myers went to different direction. Even though he was familiar with avant-garde artists, he knew people in avant-garde, but he was not impressed by the search for new visual language. He was looking for his own visual language. This is unbelievably, but this is a work from 1888, way before he went to Paris and way before European avant-garde came to the United States. He's, if I didn't tell you that it's 1888, and or if I didn't know the date, I would think that it's very modern painting. It must be at least, I don't know, 1900s plus. Because of this simplicity and collapse of forms and very minimal things, but they give you this kind of essence of this apartment block houses. And yet it's 1888. So he was already searching, finding his language, uh, but he didn't use the uh, avant-garde vocabulary. But then he switches and most of his works that I was able to find and read about were genre scenes focusing on people, mass scenes with a lot of children, with a lot of activity of kind of side activity of children in these paintings. So here we see a group of people listening to a band concert at night. Uh, and yet the foreground of the work, right? Like kind of thing that we see is children playing and hanging out and just waiting for the uh, adults. So that would be uh, something that would pique his interest. And then we look at his later uh, work. Uh, it's a painting, it's all on canvas. Uh, it looks like a book illustration with simplified outlines, uh, kind of very um, strong elements of, of, of kind of certain details. And again, look how he is the, at the center of the composition. He has a two, 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 uh, four children playing and sitting on, on benches. It captures the atmosphere of law in New York, just what I said, right? Like you go there and you end up depicting life of immigrants just because they are there. But um, for Myers, it was interesting to capture this moment of innocent youth of childhood. Um, and and he and and that would be pretty much um, one of the major aspects of his art. Now, interestingly enough, Myers was one of the artists who brought European avant-garde to the United States. Technically, is before the war, but this exhibition would be the direct uh, like would 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 will affect the development of American art. 
uh, from, from that moment on, uh, on very large scale. So the idea was to have an alternative exhibition and to bring European artists to America to, for an exhibition. Uh, to capture the diversity of uh, different artistic styles. It was, uh, sorry, actually I have to correct myself. The idea was to show art of that time. It was not limited to European artists. The idea was actually to show both American artists and European artists. And Meyer was adamant, was adamant to include as many American artists as they could. However, throughout the planning of the exhibition, uh, the emphasis has changed and there were more and more European artists that were invited and entered the exhibition. And uh, at some point there was a rapture in the, among organizers and Myers quit. He, he left the Armory Show Committee because he felt that it takes a uh, spotlight uh, on um, uh, Europeans. And if you compare American artists with Europeans at that time, Europeans are more innovative, they are stronger in this regard. So he was afraid that Americans will be downplayed uh, by Europeans. He was right, actually. <laughs> uh, so he was absolutely right. Um, and that's what happened with the Armory show. It was a breaking kind of moment uh, for many American artists and audience, but we're focusing on the artists to see what was going on in Europe. Because yes, many of them traveled, but not everyone could travel and not everyone had entrance to the avant-garde circles in the United States and sorry, in Europe. So when they saw uh, what was going on in Europe, they, it was a revelation of how art can be different. Um, I feel like I have to uh, explain just in two words why there was, a, there was a search for different art. So we mentioned the academies, we mentioned that it was very conservative and restricted and, and kind of people were tired of painting the same thing over and over again. Uh, photography started to play a very important role. And if you want to copy reality, you could photograph it. Yes, it had limitations. It wasn't what we have nowadays, but still like if you want a portrait, the photograph will make that portrait real. Um, and really capturing the, the life other than uh, painting. So um, there was this competition and artists were searching for uh, proof that art is not only imitation of reality, that it has to be something else. It has to be more because if you only kept capturing the reality, it's, it's limited. So there was a search for new topics, new ways of representing reality. Add to that scientific innovations and that microscope showed the world that was not ever visible. The flight uh, showed Earth from, from the perspective that was never visible, or at least not in, in this of this kind was visible before. The uh, scientific research opened uh, additional things that an artist realized that reality is not just what we see. Uh, and uh, there was a need to find a way to express that invisible world as well as, as well as visible world. The best way to summarize the revelation and the, this kind of moment of what is going on uh, is to compare these two works. They both were shown in the Armory show. Marcel Duchamp, uh, our famous um, Dada artist, submitted his new Descending the Staircase. Uh, and Robert Henry, the representative and kind of founding father of the Ashkan school, the teacher of Sawyer's brothers and the teacher in the Alliance exhibited this uh, figure in motion. Now, what do you think an artist entering the exhibition would experience when they saw that? Like, and you don't have to be an artist, like when you see that, what what is the first thing that kind of comes to mind? And feel free to like if people want to come back for to the camera, that would be great. If not, that's okay. But you're welcome to just kind of talk and share. Imagine that you enter the exhibition. I know we spoil like we saw everything in our days, but put yourself in the head of the you know early 20th century artist or a viewer, and you see Robert and Rees work. What would you say? I guess you'd be somewhat shocked, but you know, I don't know how much of you know art historically has a lot of nudes in it, so I'm not so sure. 
And you're Sorry. right. You'll be shocked for very simple reason. She is not Venus, right? She's not some kind of identifiable classical figure. Um, so large scale nude painting of a female body without this cover up of classical antiquity, mm -hmm. it's shocking enough. Okay. And it's not shocking anymore in, in France, but it's still shocking in America. Then if you look at the, um, at the style itself, it's not classical uh, style. It's very realistic style. The, the kind of, you have kind of dirty colors uh, that don't, I mean, she's very beautiful woman, but it's not idealized body according to the principles of classical mm -hmm. idealization. So yeah, you'll be shocked. And it's also called figure in motion. So it's not even again, like you don't have this usual stability of some kind of a subject that you can hold on to. He's depicting the motion and he's just using the figure to show the movement. Okay, so you kind of can deal with that a little bit. It's still a bit sh shocking and uh, you're not sure how to, do what, how to deal with the nudity, but you kind of okay. Uh, and then you go further <laughs> down and you see Duchamp. Mm -hmm. I mean, needless to say, it you probably the most, I mean, even in our days, it's like, what is that, right? I mean, what are we even looking yeah, What the heck? What the heck, exactly? And after, like, like, where is the nude? We, where is the nude, right? Like, I mean, it's called nude yeah. descending. But then let's let's continue looking. What at is that. the artist trying to do? I don't know. <laughs> what is he trying to do? Um, and then so let's let's look at it. So what do we see? We don't see the nude, but we do see something. So what do we see? We see the legs going down. We see some kind of repetitive motion, right? And right. when we read all these things together, you and you try really hard because you want to believe that there is a nude, right? It tells you in the title, so you want to see the nude. You might start to see the leg bending like you have a hip and the knee, and then this kind of rounded shapes um, in right in the middle that go down diagonally, probably can be compared, kind of can look like buttocks uh, and then it's a mess on the top, but if we combine the legs with the butt, you probably see some kind of a cat and maybe movements of hands. So if you try really hard, you will start seeing it. Now, if you're familiar with cubism and and dad, I'm sorry, and futurism, uh, and I have to admit that I'm I'm the language of futurist and emotion pictures is so familiar to me that I have a hard time not to see the nude in this painting. I'm used to this visual language. So I see it and but right away I see what he's trying to do because it's a language and I know it because of my profession. If you're not familiar with that, it will take you a while to start seeing it. But if I'll show you some other futurist paintings, which hopefully we'll get to see today, uh, you will have less um, difficulty to start reading the movement in futurist and Dadaist paintings. Because like they the actually, movie. excuse me? It, it's like the, uh, the early movies where you just got a little it, it, move, it you saw step uh, pieces one two three after you flipped it exactly you and you know like you can draw the like movement and then flip the pages so it's animation it's animation but they're trying to put That's this right. animation in one image and they are influenced by motion pictures and they are influenced by um, uh, you know, Maybridge was doing the photography that captured the movement of the runner or of the jumper. So they just want, they want to come up with a way for painting to show it in the same time as painting does because painting doesn't have the duration. So they're trying to overcome this limitation of painting and to show you movement, but in one single piece. We can discuss if it works or not, but that's the attempt. But what it shows to our young, still American uh, artists at that time is that you don't have to do nude all in the same traditional way. You can actually remove the nude and do the motion only because Henri is doing something interesting. He is showing figure in motion, but he's doing it old fashioned way. He's still using the figure. Duchamp dismisses the figure. He leaves just the motion of the figure. And that's a revelation. And that's what like, 
I, I want to try to do the same thing. And what, that's why uh, what they saw in the Armory show would be so important for development of American art. They saw Cezanne, they saw Van Gogh, they saw many different artists who said, we don't have to do it the same way. We don't have to use realistic image, uh, realistic way of depicting things because we're not trying to capture the reality. We're not trying to mimic it. They no longer interested in opening the window into the canvas like Renaissance artists did, right? Like the, the canvas is a surface and what's behind the surface is the window into reality. No, they are doing different things. Impression is capturing light effects. Cezanne wants to understand the structure of things. Cubists go for how far you can go away from representing reality and still understand what's going on. Like the kind of more uh, philosophical even approach uh, to art. So Armory Show, provided artists with new vocabularies, with new words, uh, if we use this uh, comparison, uh, to talk visually. <laughs> so uh, that's why it would be so important. In addition to the Armory Show, there was actually a place in, in America, in New York. And uh, coincidentally, the person who was already featuring avant-garde art uh, in his gallery was a Jewish uh, entrepreneur, Alfred Stiglitz, who uh, was a photographer himself, modernist photographer. He was trying to take photography like to new uh, adventures, to a new level. But he also was keen on bringing all this innovation uh, to the United States. And he opened the gallery, famous gallery to, uh, 291. He published the Camera Works, a magazine where they talked about photography, they talked about art and what's going on in, in Europe and in different, not just Europe. Uh, so that became this kind of um, the, the place where you could read about uh, new things happening in art. His famous, are you familiar with this photograph before I go into? Yeah, Maybe I mean, it's, it's probably like if you have a book on immigration, you probably have this photograph featured in that book. Um, so yes, he's capturing uh, two kind of levels of a ship uh, and you have the steerage down the, the lower level where the poorest travelers are traveling. And uh, the, the kind of funny thing about this photograph that it doesn't show immigrants coming to the United States as is often uh, indicated in the books that it shows immigrants. It actually shows people who were not accepted to the United States and they're sent back. Or these are people who travel back to Europe for whatever reasons they, they want, they need to travel back. So because Stiglitz took this photograph on a ship from the United States, from New York to Europe. It doesn't really matter because this photograph is about um, shapes and kind of collapse of space. It's not done in traditional way when you have kind of opening into space and you have at the center something uh, most important and things develop around it, uh, traditional according to compositional rules. Here you, you have this interesting combination of, uh, and he mentioned at some point that this hat of uh, this round shape of this gentleman here was what triggered him to see this image as the most exciting. So the emphasis on this pipe, the kind of modern um, liner, uh, the steamship that takes people across the ocean. Uh, and this, the people are secondary here. It's about shapes and, and colors. So it's a very modernist photography. Another interesting thing that he took it in 1907 uh, and didn't really feel that it's important. And then he rediscovered it in his own archives and published it in 1911. And that became the symbol of uh, photographic avant-garde. Uh, so just kind of interesting how things happen. So in his gallery, he did feature innovative artists from Europe, but also American innovative artists. And one of these very important and very interesting artists was uh, Man Ray, uh, who is actually Emanuel Radnitsky. And I happen to be a friend with his niece of some kind. <laughs> so I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly how they're related, um, but he actually had family in, in, the, in Philadelphia. But they all kind of changed names and we know that people change their names to make it more pronounceable. Rob, your assistant Rabbi made a very good job with my last name, but it's not always the case. So 
sometimes you just don't want to hear your name butchered and uh and his nickname was many and man Ray, he just kind of shortened uh his way uh, his name in some ways um now he actually traveled to Europe. He was familiar with European avant-garde. He was influenced. Uh, he saw it for the first time in Stiglitz's gallery, but he was familiar with what's going, what's going on in, in Cubist world. And he kind of tried his own uh, Cubist painting. You have five figures. The most traditional thing you can think about is nude in nature. It's the most challenging thing for artists to depict nude body in natural light conditions. You don't have control of that light. Uh, it's hard to set up as a, as a, in a studio, it's impossible. So uh, most of the artists up to 20th century or like maybe late 19th century didn't work outside. So whatever you see nude in nature from let's say 18th century, you can bet that it's a kind of fake that the nude was actually sitting in the studio of the artist inside. But of course we see that he is um, using uh, unrealistic colors. He's simplifying the form. He's not using traditional kind of modeling when you shape the figures and it's very uh, mask-like. They were looking at African art uh, influenced by alternative kind of non-Western cultures at that time. And if you're a little familiar with art history, uh, he's definitely looking at uh, Picasso's Mademoiselle de Avignon, the kind of pre, uh, pre-Cubist painting uh, addressing similar thing and using the nude in a way similar to what Duchamp is doing with his nude. The human body is secondary, is more about colors, shapes and arrangement of this uh, on canvas than the actual human body. So, uh, no, he knew how to paint an actual human figure. He doesn't want to. It's not the lack of skills. It's it's desire to do something else uh, in 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 art. Uh, but Monre is more famous. You probably uh, know him from his Dada period, and also kind of leading to Surrealist period is when he started to do ready mades He was big friends with Marcel Duchamp, who kind of did ready mades into what we know them for now. So to take an iron and to put pins on it, it's to completely subvert the very idea of an iron, like the essence of an iron is something, something smooth. Uh, and by the way, the original uh, iron was of this kind. Um, so we know from, about Man Ray's works from his photographs of his own works. He was a great photographer. The way he photographed his work contributes to our understanding of his work. So is this, interesting cooperation uh, between art and art of photography in the face of the same artist. The object itself was secondary for him. Most of them did not survive and we have replicas of him made replicas by himself. Like, so he kind of recovered his own art, but the image is so powerful. Uh, and for him to photograph his ready-made was uh, the point uh, of making it. For example, here, the enigma of Isidore du Cosset it's a uh, sewing machine covered in blanket, but it looks like kind of this mountain and silhouette of a person under and the way the ropes are going, it's like it gives this whole surrealist vibe of someone is struggling and restrained. This is replica photographed not by Man Ray. And I don't know about you, I'm actually curious to know about uh, your, your feeling. The color don't work for me. Like, it doesn't mm -hmm. do it to me, this, this kind of brown. Uh, and even though like, and the ropes don't, are not exactly the same, they don't show the same, it looks like an object wrapped in the blanket. <laughs> it doesn't look yeah. like a new model, Isidore Ducasset. Um, so, and, and they probably could try to emulate this, the photograph uh, that Monray did, but look how shadows contribute to the whole impression of what we see. So it's a photograph really, the artwork here is a photograph, not the object um, itself. In the later time in life, he did painting. He was obsessed with his uh, former lover. They actually uh, became friends in later life, like kind of, um, so it's a good story. Uh, but the idea is that he was not limiting himself to any specific medium or to any specific genre. One of the things that happens to art in art history, and I, you know, I studied that for so many years and I, taught it in colleges, like basic uh, uh, art history survey. 
um, we go by periods uh, and we don't really take into consideration that artists lived a long life. So we learn about Man Ray in his 1920s, what he was doing. And I kind of had to do it for this lecture to figure out so what was going on with him in later life. Sometimes it's not that interesting, but sometimes they continue to do very interesting work. But we are interested in the most kind of most important moment and overlook the rest of their careers, which I don't think is fair. So here is a tribute to later Man Ray's work. He continues to be quite um, interesting. It's a giant painting. It's really large scale. Now, uh, we kind of uh, a bit short on time, but I do want to highlight some other American Jewish artists who were not kindly treated by history, uh, but are recovered now. Uh, so for example, again, just kind of curious, have you ever heard of Florine Stadheimer? Um, okay. No, so, uh, okay, so some people did, some people didn't. Toby, may I ask you, um, just curious, in what context? I've seen something in a museum. Okay. I, I can't yeah. remember exactly what, when, but if, yeah. if, if I ever recognize any name, it's because I've seen it's it. Because. Again. <laughs> yeah. So she, uh, uh, what, she had her retrospective at MoMA, I believe. But, uh, but this woman was the heart of avant-garde New York. Uh, she was an artist herself. She's coming from a Jewish family and all of her, her mother, uh, their father actually abandoned them, which is not very typical in Jewish families uh, of that of that kind of status. But um, they had enough of kind of inheritance and income to enable the mother to take her three daughters to travel and live in Europe for quite length, like lengthy periods of time. And um, Florine was able to attend classes in Paris in different uh, venues. Uh, and she also studied in the Art Student League, and she was only able to do that as a woman, being a woman, as because it was Art Student League that enabled uh, our women artists to take classes there. Um, so she developed her own artistic style that I'm going to show you. But most importantly, she was this kind of her house, her home was a beacon for uh, avant-garde artists who came to the United States as a result of the outbreak of World War I. Uh, you probably heard that uh, lots of artists were kind of escaping. Some of them escape, were escaping the trial. Some of them were Jewish and they were running away from Europe. Some of them were just kind of uh, waiting it out. Uh, and many of them came to, to the US. Uh, this is a painting that's actually at Pafa. Uh, so I, I, I did see it myself in person. It's large, it's very brightful. The image doesn't do it justice. Uh, it's all on canvas, but it kind of looks like pastel. That would be another favorite thing for uh, more kind of contemporary or modern artists to do is to subvert the qualities of the medium to make oil look like pastel, to make pastels look like oil. That was an interesting challenge for them in terms of the medium. Um, so where but, is this painting? It's at Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts okay. in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, but she developed her very own style. She knew all of these artists. They were hanging out in her home. Uh, it was literally a salon. Uh, one of the st her stories was also known. Um, Jewish Museum in New York had uh, an exhibition dedicated to different Jewish women salons uh, and different kind of context of where they would host cultural individuals and kind of artists and singers and you name it. So she was one of this uh, one of these salons which attracted uh, very interesting individuals who were not very well accepted in a more traditional circles because they were, either gay, uh, too avant-garde, and Jewish. Uh, so she became this kind of safe heaven for very alternative style people and people who were not uh, uh, accepted in mainstream society because of their religion, uh, such as Jews. Because with all due respect to America's freedoms and separation of religion from state and everything like that, and the fact that Jews were very well um, uh, were doing really well in America, they were still 
discriminated in some ways against. And if you're uh, aware of American Jewish history, the early 20th century was actually the rise of antisemitism in America. And um, starting from the very early 19th century, um, 20th century, partially because of the wave of new immigrants, partially of prehistories, uh, what ha was happening is that uh, certain places, certain establishments were, uh, Jews were not allowed, were not accepted. There were signs, Gentiles only, meaning Jews and cannot go there. Uh, and the way to answer this situation was that Jews opened their own establishments or their own Catskills results, resorts and, and stuff like that. So um, they were not accepted in certain areas. They had their own very well established circle. Uh, and Florine Stadheimer was representative of that trend when uh, they had their own um, cultural circle. In this particular painting, uh, we have Florine laying down on the black kind of rug in the red. Next to her is uh, Nadelman, a sculptor. Uh, and the funny thing that right next to this painting, we have Nadelman's sculpture and he's famous for kind of rounded figures with crossed legs. So his legs in the painting mimicking his sculpture, I should have had an example, sorry. I, but if you look him up, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, in purple suit is Marcel Duchamp with characteristic hair uh, and those are uh, uh, sisters. Um, so it's playful, it's kind of whimsical painting. Um, and most of her works around this time show this um, kind of group portraits um, and very ironic. And it's also self irony that, that she is uh, featuring in her work. Um, now, so Stadheimer is a great example, as I mentioned, of the way Jews found an alternative uh, and uh, kind of overcame the limitations that were imposed on them around this time. But it also shows uh, where uh, the avant-garde circle would communicate because they would gather together, they would share ideas, they would read poems, they would see each other works and discuss these works. So it was shared space and exchange of ideas. And this kind of salon, so galleries, it's uh, Stiglitz's gallery provided that space for them to share these ideas. So I'll remind you, we're talking about the world without internet and Facebook did not exist. So in order to find out what's going on, what other people are doing, they needed a forum. In Paris, this were the cafes, right? And like of places where avant-garde artists would gather. In New York, the places that I mentioned would be uh, that venue that would, would be that circle where avant-garde artists exchange ideas. So Max Weber would be another example uh, of an artist who embraced avant-garde uh, learned from the masters, but look, he's learning from Cezanne. He's learning uh, learning from Char Chardin. You see Chardinial dictionary. Chardin is a still life painter from France, from academic tradition, but it's also very Cezanne-esque uh, painting. So he is merging uh, the different styles, different traditions in the way of developing his visual language. But he is also taking in futurism and cubism. Mm -hmm. And when I said that, when you see you next time, Futurist painting, you will have less uh, less difficulty to kind of figure out what's going on, because you don't want to look for things. You actually don't need to see a nude figure or anything specific. You need to ask yourself, how do you feel? Like, what do you feel when you see this work? And I don't know about you. I kind of use my hands to talk. That's why Zoom is so not good for me. It makes the blur. But if you had, if I would ask you to kind of, and you can do it in, without showing us, like if you had to conduct this painting, imagine that you're a conductor, right? What kind of noise would you hear and what, how would you conduct it, right? So you probably would have a lot of kind of staccato movements and the noise would be horrible and yet it will be regular because if you look at the lines, they develop in, in every possible direction, but there is a rhythm to all of it. It's noisy, it's clashing, but it's also very rhythmical and very, yes, mechanical, but also vibrant and kind of energizing, right? And this is what he's trying to show. We should not look for cars or trains or people or buildings. You will start to see those eventually. Like you will see that that looks like apartment building. That might be stairwell, like, you know, New York has all this fire escape, but it would be reference to railroad. Like, the, is it a car? 
with a light in the train or something like that. It doesn't really matter, but you'll see these elements reduced to the effect of their motion, effect of their sound. And that's what he's depicting, the rush hour. Um, so this idea of using painting to express things that before were unimaginable in painting, right? Like who, who would express, if you want to show love, you show Venus. That's how symbolism and painting work. This is not a symbol of the rush hour. It's an attempt to capture the very essence of the rush hour. Uh, I am going to skip a little since we're running out of time because I wanna bring us to the end of the period and closer to the World War II, because of course the World War II, first America, first the depression years, but also World War II specifically, brought a rapture in the world. The world was never the same after that. Um, and uh, we can, there is attempt in art history to kind of trace the development of style and see how things have changed uh, based on changes in the world. We just don't have time to do it. But I do want to mention that so far I showed you Jewish painters, but I didn't really show you any Jewish subject. We said that they identified Jewishly, they had they were centers of Jewish community or Jewish gatherings, but there was nothing really Jewish in their work. And that would be uh, quite, is, quite typical for American artists. The identity you, of your Jewishness didn't have to be expressed in your painting. There was no conflict in, in it. Uh, Weber, however, did pick uh, Jewish themes. He depicted uh, multiple Jewish themes, Jewish genre scenes. He, applied cubist style or kind of his own style by that time. Uh, and um, just giving you one example, but there were others. Uh, and so here he's showing sh Shabbat, Shabbat, sorry, uh, how do you say it in English? I'll just say Shabbat, um, with the kind of Jewish family gathering. And then as we move to later times, the theme is the same, the style is very different. He moves away from cubist breaking of the form and kind of simplifying and collapsing space. Uh, it's so, and it becomes a bit more lyrical. Um, it's still not very realistic space, but it has a bit more depth in it. So he goes back to tradition in some ways, uh, but it's also very personal at this point. So I would dare to say, I'm not a specialist in Weber, but it looks like, he experimented enough to develop his own way and he is not stuck in any specific style. And that's what I love about uh, these uh, art artists. They do whatever they want. They don't respond, like art historians try to put them into categories, they don't care. <laughs> they don't let us do that. They do their own thing and he just switched from one style to another and, um, and, it's, uh, and it's amazing. In 1942, he painted this work and I just kind of wanted just to use it. Um, it. It doesn't necessarily refer to the Holocaust. Uh, he didn't say that, he didn't really explain his work. That's another thing, artists paint, they don't talk about their art with some exceptions, but mostly. And yet in the context of World War II and things that they're learning, they don't know yet everything that's going to be revealed at the end of the World War II, but 1942, they know enough of the horror that's happening. And uh, when you look at his uh, choice of the subject and his style, you cannot help not to think about uh, that he's reflecting on the tragedy. And just kind of jumping forward, uh, Jewish American artists would really pick the fallen art uh, and this rapture that happened in at the end uh, with the World War II when there was a strong realization that it's impossible to continue in the same way. Art didn't save the world. Uh, whatever we were doing is suddenly irrelevant because of, uh, of what they, I'm talking about uh, Jewish artists specifically. It's not just about Jews, but we are just kind of focusing on them. So abstract expressionism, which started to develop before the war, but after the war, abstract expressionism became that kind of style that was used as a Cold War, Cold War weapon. It was an alternative to socialist realism happening in Stalinist Russia. So it represented the free world and all that. Uh, but it was also uh, a way for uh, artists to 
move away from representation and move away from tradition and yet to continue to use painting to express feelings, to express ideas. They try to reduce it to manipulation of pigment on, can on, on canvas um, and to say that there is no subject in their work, but it, it, it didn't really work. We, uh, many artists, especially specifically um, Newman and Mark Rothko, uh, addressed the theme of tragedy, addressed the theme of existentialism, of uh, like one in front of this whole world, and their style um, reflects that search. For example, Newman's painting with the zip uh, uh, in his writing, like we, we know that he was in learning Talmud, he was uh, looking into Kabbalah. And so in many ways, his paintings are interpreted through Jewish lens. Um, and then Rothko, of course, with this whole focus on tragedy and uh, the history of his family cannot, like we cannot, I, I, we don't really buy that he was completely not interested in a subject matter of the work. So it's a little kind of squished. My, my ending is a little squished. I wish we had a bit more time, but I wanted to show how American artists were searching for new language, how Jews were finding themselves in different camps or different ways of uh, answering the question, what is art? How do you paint? What do you paint? We find Jews anywhere in all styles, in all kinds of art in America. And what's really makes this country amazing is that uh, if they questioned their Jewish identity, it was not because they had to choose uh, who to be in, but because it was their personal questioning. And same with style, there was, um, they, they could find and different ways of expressing themselves. And it's just amazing how they did find different ways of expressing themselves. So whenever I lead, whenever I do a lecture on uh, Jewish art, I, and I, we start with the question, what is Jewish art? And we, we end with the question, I could show you 500 other, maybe not 500, but like dozens of other artists, they would do very different art and we still will not answer the question, what is Jewish art or what is Jewish artist? But I hope you enjoyed it. And um, we looked at some good artists today. Yeah. So I'm happy to stay a bit longer for questions uh, and uh, comments of any kind. And thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. It was very interesting and uh, I think it was great. So, do you have any questions? My only question, but it's not a particularly Jewish question, is when you were showing us, uh, in particular, the Duchamp, if you didn't have the title there, would you have any idea whatsoever what you were looking at? But that that that's you know true of so many yeah. in modern yeah. art. Um, it I mean it's hard for me to say. I would guess no. We no. probably would not. Um, we probably would still be able to talk about motion, right? Like we would still feel that he was trying to show some repetitiveness. So what we when we do, um, I'll answer the question in a slightly different way. Uh, so I work with kids in the museum a lot and they don't know art history. They don't know who is Duchamp. They don't know most of the things that it's a, for many, it's the first time they come to a museum. We look at paintings with them. We do give them some background, but we don't start there. We just look at paintings. We just ask them, what do you see? And it's amazing how kids who are not loaded with this pre-knowledge and who are not uh, craving to understand what's going on, how free they are in just describing what they see. And as they describe what they see, they start to figure out what's going on. We adults have to know, right? Like it makes us very uncomfortable when we don't understand what's going on. So I just encourage you all, just let it go. Just look at works. Don't even look at titles of who is the artist. Just start from just looking at it and ask yourself, what do I actually see? Not what I know, but what do I see? And you'll discover that your eye is giving enough information to your brain to read the works. Uh, and then you can read the title and see if you were right. 
<laughs> probably I actually, we're not really right. like, I actually really liked when you said, what do you feel when you look at this? What do you feel is the next because, right, because step? Even without because, the yeah. title, yep. I felt like nervous, but you know, looking at this, but. That's great. So he's successful, right? Uh, <laughs> he's giving you this kind of guttural reaction. Uh, and that's what they want because they're showing either movement or feeling or some kind of emotional or like physical response to the work. Um, when you see it in person, you also notice the brush stroke and the textures. So that also adds to that. Any other thoughts? All right. Um, thank you. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank My you. Pleasure. Thank you. So I will stop the recording.